Tonight on The Late Debate, after billions in bailouts, can London's transport network recover from the financial impact of the pandemic? We have an exclusive interview with the man in charge. Also tonight, as the big climate change summit looms, the green challenges facing homeowners. We want to make it as ecologically friendly as possible and, you know, just want to make sure that we're doing our bit for the environment. Good evening. Transport for London has swallowed more than £4 billion in taxpayers' cash since the start of the pandemic. Getting London's transport system back on track is just one of many headaches for the man at the helm. We'll be talking to him in just a moment. The Tube is coming back to life. This week, the underground carried more rush hour commuters than at any time since the start of the pandemic. As Londoners go back to work, crowded carriages and standing room only are once again part of the daily ritual. I've been coming in pretty much since the beginning of the summer and this week you really, really notice the difference, it's much busier. It's a bit of a worry when people don't wear masks but otherwise, you know, you've got to take care of your, take care of yourself really. We've got to live with it. At the end of the day, if we don't live with it, you know, we're going to all suffer immeasurably so we've just got to get on with life and uh, provided we're wearing some form of face mask, I think I feel all right. Some passengers might be wary but the great return to work can't come soon enough for Transport for London. The government's instruction in March 2020 to stay at home devastated TfL's income from fares. Since then, it's needed more than £4 billion in government bailouts and a long-term finance deal has yet to be agreed. You need long-term funding settlements so that you can plan for the future, so you can make the right investments and you can keep the whole transport network running. If we have piecemeal settlements six months at a time, what are we going to end up seeing? Cuts to services, potential cuts to bus services and so on. A new funding agreement is only one of TfL's priorities. Crossrail was meant to open in 2018 but still isn't ready. The cost of that project has risen from £14 billion to £19 billion. Next month, the ultra-low emission zone will expand from central London to include all roads inside the north and south circulars. A rescue plan for Hammersmith Bridge needs to be thrashed out between TfL, the government and Hammersmith and Fulham Council. And this week, it emerged a new sponsor is needed for London's cable car. Joining me now is London's Transport Commissioner, Andy Byford. Andy, welcome to the late debate. Can I start with the big one first? Because you've got lots in your intro, but the big one is funding. Sure. How much money do you need from the government? Well, what we've said is that we can be self-sufficient uh, on a day-to-day -day operations and maintenance ba basis by 2023, which isn't so very far away, but we still need some assistance in the run-up to that period. So another £500 million for the remainder of this financial year, up to 31st of March 2022, and then £1.2 billion pounds for the next financial year after that, 22-23. After that, we can be back to covering our costs, which we were before the pandemic hit. So um, I'm looking to put together a deal that will cover those operating costs. And then after that, all we will be looking for is assistance with capital costs, which is, of course, the absolute norm across the world. That's to pay for new things, obviously. That's right. But the money that you need in the interim to keep ticking over to get you through this period, the government's going to want something in return. What are those concessions going to be? Are, are you going to offer driverless tube trains for example? Well, look, at the end of the day, I'd say f uh, first up, I'd like to say how grateful I am for the funding that we have received from government. We, we get that we weren't going to get a blank cheque. There were always going to be conditions assigned to those uh, to that funding. It's public money after all. Um, those conditions so far have mostly been about savings and cuts. Sa well, s savings, certainly. And uh, at the, uh, you know, we, we've got to put together um, a compelling case to government to, to justify further funding. And, and I, I fully accept that. I do expect there to be probably some more conditions. Uh, but Is I driverless tube trains likely to be that, one of them? That's one of the conditions at the moment. That doesn't mean to say we're going to do that. The condition is that we have to look at uh, the possibility of driverless trains. So 
I, I need the funding. We have no other alternative but government. The government's the only banker. If they stipulate that we should look again at the business case, we previously looked at it, uh, we will take a look at it. Uh, my personal view is the money would be much better spent on finishing off re-signalling the whole of the tube. That would be money much better spent. But in the meantime, we're cooperating with the conditions that have been set to us. That's the price of uh, these government bailouts. The mayor, who's ultimately your boss, has floated the idea of a boundary charge. Motorists from outside Greater London being charged up to £5.50 every day to drive in. Is that still on the cards? Well, it's still being looked at. My team are working on a proposal, on a report to put before the mayor, and that's not yet been submitted. Uh, the mayor's very clear position is that a more equitable solution to, to, to raise the £500 million per year that we would need, it would be for Londoners to be able to benefit from retention of vehicle excise duty. Only Londoners don't keep the vehicle exercise, excise duty that so they So far pay. the mayor has failed to convince Rishi well, Sunak of that argument. Government have said they will not entertain vehicle excise duty. They, so the boundary charge is still a possibility. They don't still seem alive. that keen on Greater London boundary charge as well. So we have a bit but of you a dilemma. You think you've got the, the law on your side. You think you can in, in, implement that? Well, we, we need to find a way, we need to find some a mechanism that is politically palatable, and this is the dilemma of the job, nature of the job I have, that is acceptable to City Hall and is also acceptable to central government. Uh, in some ways, I'm sanguine about where that money comes from. Uh, all I know is we need an, an additional revenue source to plug a very big gap that has been caused by the pandemic. You have the congestion charge. Uh, it was increased for the pandemic. It was supposed to be temporary, but it's now staying at £15. Have you thought, are, are you likely to think about charging electric cars? There are lots more of them. At the moment, they're exempt, but ultimately, they're going to cause congestion. That, that hasn't been looked at yet. Uh, we, we are looking at all sorts of revenue options uh, because we've got to make sure that we, we not only cover our day-to-day -day costs, we are mandated by government to cover our day-to-day -day costs from the, effectively the 1st of April 2023, uh, which is not so very far away. Um, and I'm very keen to get back to a position of self-sufficiency. Why? Because that means then we're off government funding and we're back in control of our own destiny. We know that we can run a very good service. We, we previously did uh, with almost without government subsidy, which I would just remind everyone watching is unique in world, major world transport systems. We don't get any government, central government funding. We've seen a lot of bike lanes spring up during the pandemic. There's been a good deal of opposition to low traffic neighbourhoods. Are you wedded to that, to, to them, to those continuing and expanding? I'm wedded, I'm wedded to keeping London moving. Uh, uh, the, uh, the fact is that um, London streets are getting ever busier. Uh, a lot of side streets were completely and hopelessly clogged with traffic with the uh, delays that that brings, the frustration that that brings, and also the increasingly toxic air quality that that brings. So we are working with uh, councils to look at where schemes make sense, where low traffic neighbourhoods make sense. And I would accept that, and this was partly as a result of government policy, we were, f we were told to, to expedite the implementation of the early LTNs. Uh, I would like to see much more consultation so that we try to get a consensus in communities where they make sense. Uh, where they don't make sense, we are quite open to, to making tweaks, but I make no apology for trying to cut the number of rat running and dangerous driving and clogged streets that are out there. At the end of the day, we want to have um, uh, uh, people using public transport, riding, uh, cycling, walking, uh, it's a much healthier future for our city. What about all those pavements that were widened for social distancing? We're all vaccinated now, do we need them to be that wide? We keep that under review. In some cases, in some areas, they, they do need to, to stay wide. You're already seeing a lot of people, as your uh, video role suggested, the, the city's coming back to life. And we do want to um, encourage people to walk. It's a more healthier option if you've got that option and if, if you're not walking over a very long distance. But in some cases, the, the pavements can go back to the size that they previously were. So we've got a team who's working on that. Uh, it's, um, it's done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, certainly, we're, our job is to keep London moving and uh, that means also sharing the road with road, uh, car users. Have you got an opening date for Crossrail yet? I've said publicly it will not slip beyond what that which we inherited when I took it in-house into TfL, which is the first half of 2022 uh, next year. I stand by that. There will be no further slippage on schedule, but I have tasked my team 
challenge my team to get to the earliest part of that window possible. So uh, at the well, moment, what, what, what is the earliest part? Well, we're we're still in trial running at the moment, Simon. We're we're running uh, tri uh, 12 trains per hour, which will be the opening configuration. As long as that goes well, then we have one more construction blockade to do in October. Then we move into trial operations, and then we will we will we will be at a point of being able to say we're ready to open. So. I'm, I'm tasking my team with the earliest possible uh, date, but no one will thank me if it's unsafe on opening or if it's unreliable. It's got to be safe, reliable, and it will be the envy of the world. It is absolutely superb. I have a daily conference call on Crossrail, including weekends and bank holidays. I, it's my personal mission to get that line open. The ultra low emission zone is being extended, expanded mm -hmm. in October. Correct. There's been a lot of grumbling about it. Are you expecting people to be taken by surprise, to suddenly find out that they're being clobbered for fees that they didn't realise they'd have to pay? Well, we're trying to avoid that. We have sent out millions of emails. We've used the DVLA's database to contact those people who we know have cars that would uh, attract the, the, the fee. Because don't forget, if, you're, if your car is currently compliant, you don't have to pay the fee. So uh, we're doing a big campaign, and a media, using all sorts of media, radio campaigns, TV campaigns, happy to talk about it now. Don't forget why it's there. The, the ultra low emission zone where it currently operates in the centre of town has cut nitrogen dioxide by 40%, in fact nearly 50%. You know, it's a huge reduction in a very noxious gas that, that you know, is very uh, harmful to everyone. you accept it's going to be a big change for an awful lot of people? It is a big change and that's why we're putting so much effort into making sure that, cus that uh, car drivers know that if you've got a non-compliant car, you will be subject to that fee from the uh, late October date to the 24th, uh, 25th of October. Andy Byford, thank you very much for coming in to talk to us this You're evening. Very welcome. Now, in just seven weeks, the eyes of Westminster will turn to Glasgow. COP26, the big climate summit, is a huge moment for Boris Johnson's government. But for ordinary Londoners, the challenges of climate change are much closer to home. In a city of nine and a half million people, ensuring everyone lives in a green home is a tall order. But on a building site in Walthamstow, the developers of one new housing project are doing their bit. What you can see here is, uh, is a clay brick wall that's going to be used in the party walls of the houses. So the actual bricks themselves have just been pressed or just pressed clay. And the clay was dug up for the foundations. Bricks from an old industrial building on the site are being recycled. Skips are banned because waste is reused. Solar panels on the roof and air source heat pumps instead of gas boilers will supply hot water and heating. The residents will have little to no utility bills, um, certainly not from an energy or electricity perspective. Um, so that was really the driver here, because our, our demographic has traditionally been first-time buyers and young families. So if you can shave you know, a few thousand pounds off a running cost of a home every year, it can have a massive difference. Older homes will also need to be greened up. The owners of this 1930s cottage at West Byfleet in Surrey are hoping cavity wall insulation will reduce their carbon footprint and their heating bills. We want to make it as ecologically friendly as possible and, you know, just want to make sure that we're doing our bit for the environment. Some homeowners take advantage of government and local council grants, but is enough being done to advertise them? That's where the issue is. I think it's been left quite a lot for the, for the industry people to do their own sort of marketing and awareness and actually there needs to be such a big education change in the country that it does need to be led probably by the government a bit better now. We need to make sure that everyone is able to benefit from better insulated homes and, um, you know, and homes that, that stay cool in heat waves as well because the extreme heat is as much of an issue for people's health as extreme cold. This summer, Londoners experienced a series of flash floods. They were blamed on climate change. The government wants the UK to be net zero by 2050. The mayor wants London to be a net zero city by 2030. Joining me to discuss that and other issues are Rupert Huck, the Labour MP for Ealing Central and Acton, Nikki Aiken, the Conservative MP for the cities of London and Westminster, and from her office, Manira Wilson, the Liberal Democrat MP for Twickenham. Welcome all of you. We seem very good at setting targets on climate change, but do we know individually what we as Londoners should be doing to meet those targets? What do you think, Rupert? I mean, you're right that the government talks a good talk and it's a very ambitious programme. They've got 78% reduction, I think. Um, not often always clear what the means to do that are. And remember, this is the government that cut the feed-in tariff. So that was where when you have sort of solar panels on your roof, it pays for itself after a while. They also cut the DEC, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, uh, after 
David Cameron used to pose with huskies. I think he said, let's cut the green CRAP. Do, do you know, know what you personally should Look, be doing? This last year, I've gone over to an induction hob. I used to like gas and flaming up my thing. But, um, you know, I've switched to that. I hardly ever drive. I cycle everywhere. Uh, all those kind of things went on a staycation this year all those so yeah there are small sacrifices we can make Nikki I think you're, you're do, doing a staycation are you doing anything else well things like recycling I've become a bit a bit of a recycling guru if you like uh, and it drives my children mad to be honest um, but I think we've all got a part to play all of us as individuals but also councils the GLA the mayor uh, and, and and government and this government I think is the most progressive green government we have ever seen the most ambitiously green we've ever seen you know we've already reduced our emissions by nearly 50 percent in the last 30 years there's more to do but you know i think we are on the right road manira do you agree with nikki that this is the most ambitiously green government we've ever seen no far from it i mean it was just earlier this year that they scrapped the green homes grant uh, the grant referred to in your in your video that's been given to local authorities is much smaller, goes uh, requires much more form filling and bureaucracy and is far narrower in terms of its ambition. We need a 10 year emergency program to help everybody to insulate their homes, to really help us reduce carbon emissions. And we need to be doing much, much more to encourage people to use public transport and walk, walk and cycle where possible. Um, and yet, you know, here we have today in my neck of the woods, we've got a consultation to slash some of our train services by up to 50% because of the uh, pressures being put by the Department for Transport on South Western Railway. This is well, not I think the that's way. a bit rich, to be honest, Manira, because if you look at how many billions, billions of pounds the government has put into TfL over recent years, we, we had the Transport Commissioner on, and you know he accepts that they've got to uh, they've they've got to do something about their finances. Uh, can you imagine what the money that has been given to TfL could do but to improve is, infrastructure well, I wasn't in the north about of TfL. I wasn't talking about TfL. I was talking about, TfL. I was talking about Southwestern government. Railway, where where they've got uh, conditions in their contract to rationalise services, and they're looking to cut services from zone four and five train stations where there are no tube alternatives in my constituency by up to 50% by the end of next Manira, year. Manira, isn't, isn't that because fewer people are using the trains at the moment? Well, but they are at the moment, but we, haven't, but, but we haven't we haven't yet bottomed out what our post-pandemic travel patterns are going to be. So I absolutely accept that on an ongoing temporary basis, we may need fewer train services, but to make per decisions about permanent cuts for the end of to come in at the end of next year it's far too soon people are just starting to go back to work again we don't know what the demands will be and to cut a zone four train station services in half is just outrageous frankly and well, we'll just put 12, people back into their cars the government has announced 12 billion pounds investment into the green economy uh creating nearly a quarter of a million green jobs in the next so uh, why have you scrapped the Green Homes Grant, at Nikki? Why because it's I mean, again, Labour's feed-in tariff, gone. The department that used to do this, gone. And, I mean, London is the only capital city on earth, I think, where there's no central government subsidy for its Can transport. I ask all of you, do you know what to do when your old gas boiler expires? Are you going to buy electric, or have you decided... Uh, is I it think clear? It'll be, a, it'll be a pump, won't it, I think? I'm waiting... I think we're, again... Yeah, lots of jumpers? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, I think you're right, Simon. We still, even us as MPs, aren't exactly aware of what's going on. But again, it's, 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 it, this is going to be uh, you know, a marathon. We've all got to do our bit um, and play our part. And the government is, is supporting that. This, this, this government you know, was uh, one of the first, wasn't it the first in the G7 or the G20 to, um, to, to, to announce that we were going to cut emissions by 2050, well, end emissions by 2050. One of the things flagged by the mayor today is that uh, there are an awful lot of uh, conservation areas in London and they... 80% of my, 80, 80 of my uh, constituency uh, uh, is Manira, that must be a problem for you. I mean, people in conservation areas can't get planning permission necessarily to put solar panels on the roof. No, but they could. there are all sorts of things that can be done around insulation. But I, I just want to come back on Nikki's point about doing more for London. I mean, one very easy thing the government could do that could help us in reducing carbon emissions in London is take the threat of a third runway off the table at Heathrow. And yet they are still committed to that 
plan and that will put our carbon emissions through the roof. Heathrow is already the biggest emitter of uh, carbon emissions in, in the country. So why won't, why won't Boris come good with his promise of lying down in front of the bulldozer? R Rupert, your constituents need Heathrow, don't they? Our, my constituents would like Heathrow to remain as it is. But as said, it's actually not just the biggest emitter of uh, CO2 in the country, in the whole of Europe. So again, why does it need an extra run mate? Wait, we sort of want a better Heathrow, not a bigger Heathrow. Can we move on to another story today? Cressida Dick, it looks almost certain that she's going to have her contract extended for two years, despite an awful lot of controversies in the last couple of years. What do you all think? Nice work if you can get it, because I think her salary is 230000 But look, I mean, it's good to see a woman in post for the first time ever. However, you do want someone who's up to the job. And you're right, there's a long list of scandals. I first came across this name in the John Charles de Menezes shoot to kill era. She was the officer in charge of that operation. That's right. And, and the family criticised the appointment in the first place. Today's uh, extension has been criticised by the Daniel Morgan family because that uh, was a bit of a whitewash. And then since then, we've seen the um, Bieber, Henry and Nicole Smallman cases where nothing seemed to have happened. So many the things Euros on there. The Euros fiasco at exactly. Wembley. Exactly. The Sarah Turnstiles Everard at Wembley. Case, yeah. The, yeah, Sarah Manira, Everard, are you, the are you happy with Cressida Dick staying in post? No, absolutely not. I'm, I'm really shocked to hear about the extension. I mean, Rupert's referred to the letter today, but actually the Liberal Democrats called on her to consider her position at the time of the Sarah Everard uh, vigil, which I thought her management and decisions around that were very, very badly judged. And the police watchdog though cleared her after Morgan. that. Uh, yeah, well, but the point is we wouldn't have seen the scenes that we had if it had been managed better and it was going to be a peaceful, safe vigil. The reason we ended up with the trouble we had was because that that was not facilitated. We saw vigils up and down the country that took place safely that didn't end up in that sort of chaos. And then we had the, the Danny Morgan report. I mean, I just think her position is utterly untenable and I'm really shocked to see her contract being renewed. What do you think, Nikki? I think that it's probably the toughest job in policing in this country. Um, I think there will be uh, very good reasons why the Home Secretary and the Mayor of London decided to uh, give her an extra two years. Um, I think it's very important. To, I, I really, as, as um, Rupert suggests, I think it's, it's great to have a woman in the, in the post, but it has to be the right woman. Um, I think we've got to, you know, this decision has been made. I, I, was, I was having a meeting at New Scotland Yard this morning and you know, it was very clear that um, violent crime and robbery have, have come down dramatically over the last couple of years. We still have serious knife crime issues, um, but the Met are tackling that. My concern, Simon, is when we have protests like we have in the last fortnight with XR, that takes 2,000 police officers a day to, to, to police in a small area like central London. And that, 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 those are the questions we really need to be ask, asking is, what are our police officers actually going to do? Rupert, Nikki and Manira, thank you very much for joining us here on The Late Debate today. I'll be back next month in the run up to the budget and the spending review. And of course, we'll also be looking ahead again to COP26. Until then, thank you for watching and good night.